Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the second Sunday in Lent, which falls on March 5, 2023, are from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4a. The psalm is 121. Romans 4 is the second reading, uh, Romans 4, 1 through 5, and then 13 through 17. And now our gospel turns to John for the next four Sundays of Lent, John 3, 1 through 17. So we have what to- What do we expect? What? Like, why, I mean, we do this every three years. Like what's, what holds these four John texts together? Are they just all good stories? Well, that's a great question. I think I, I I think in part it depends on. Well, I'll say a couple things. One, maybe just a more than a couple things, but one is <laughs> <That's a bad laughs> one. <clears throat> no, I one. My is, work here is done. Yes, right. <laughs> You've set me up well. Here we go. We set back and listen. <laughs> no, I I think uh, one of the as we know one of the major challenges for preaching John is the the length of the discourse or the length of the passages. As I've often said, John does not lend um, himself to pericope preaching or that's just the pericopes are so massive. And so I think that's part of what a preacher needs to do, Matt, is to look at these four texts coming up and saying, what is the link that you want to draw? What's the what's the thread that you want to follow uh, for each of these passages? Because you that will then enable the preacher to drop down in a certain part of the passage and and look at that verse or that those couple of verses rather than taking on each passage in its its entirety as a whole, which is almost impossible. And so I think determining that determining that thread is really key. And and it goes back to what you want. If you have a particular theme in Lent or is there something that you know that your congregation needs to hear? And so how do you let that be the filter for the, the larger theme in John that these that these passages uh, seem to be seem to be calling attention to? So I think that's a really important. I so this smile. is not just like, oh, go ahead. I, I just, this is silly. I just smile as you say, uh, John doesn't lend himself to um, a pericope pe uh, preaching. That's only if I'm trying to preach in a Lutheran context, in a Wesleyan context, or in <laughs> a, 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 a Baptist context, particularly an African-American Baptist context. This only gets me started. <laughs> <laughs> you were yeah. going to say something more substantive, Matt. No, I was just going to say it. I, I think because it's Lent, we look at this and we zero in on, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. In other words, we because it's Lent, we think we have to always be pointing ahead to the cross, which, mm -hmm. again, is not a bad thing. I'm not against that. But I, I would worry that we we're going to strip some things away from this passage we'll certainly strip some things away from the samaritan woman at the well next week if we're just talking about how death is in the air that mm -hmm. that you know in in john jesus has already judged the world there's kind of a good lenten theme uh there's there's aspects of how what he's doing in his interactions with these people, whether it's Nicodemus here, the Samaritan woman next week. I forgot what's after that, but John nine, me, John nine. nine, another interaction, right? That it's, it's all about, not all about one of the things that's going on is Jesus is uh, revealing himself in the midst of these conversations in the midst of human, either ingenuity or ignorance or disappointment or whatever is going on. In, in the various scenes. And so I'd say, don't be too quick to use John as a, as a, as a runway to passion to Holy week. No, I, it's I heretical or am I okay? No, I think that's, I think that's true. The actually, I think the, 
the runway <laughs> is not so much the passion narrative as it is the resurrection. Uh, mm -hmm. And and but to do that in such a way that you honor the passion and the crucifixion at the same time, John w won't let us skip over that. But when we get to John 11, which is the fifth Sunday of Lent, and the misunderstanding of Martha with regard to what is Jesus offering, I am I am the resurrection and the life. That's really what each of these passages is about. Uh, it, or one thing this passage is about is what kind of life is Jesus offering to each of these individuals, and what does life mean? And and uh, and that that's in part what I I think the the Lenten Easter promise is is uh, is a sense of uh, what does it what does it mean that God enters into the human life and uh, and what are the promises that follow? So uh, I I don't think that it has to be it, it and it shouldn't be just the passion because this this gospel is uh, in particular really pushing past it all the time <laughs> and um, and but at the same time holding it there. I mean it's that's the tension. But it is all it's always pushing past uh, it, pushing past but at the same time holding the present. So it, it's kind of a misreading, I think, if you just say this is going to be about the death of Jesus, which at the end of the day for John, and this might be heretical too, but it's actually not because it's John, I didn't make it up, is uh, that the the passion is the end of the incarnation. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, but what Jesus promises is the resurrection and then the ascension, which we'll talk about more in a couple of weeks. So mm -hmm. um, that, and that's the lifting up, right? That's where you can really, that's the corrective on the lifting up because it's not just the cross. It's the resurrection. I will be lifted up at the resurrection and I will be lifted up at the ascension. So right. you have to hold all of those together. So it's a, it's a complicated theological endeavor because you're really holding all of these realities of of the of the Jesus of the word becoming flesh at at once and um but i think the i think one way to enter into this is what kind of life is Jesus inviting people into and that is and in itself it's what we talked about last week right that 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 can be a focus for lent is uh is how does one what how does one understand one's life with god and um, and how, how what that means. So yeah, some thoughts there. Yeah, and you 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 talk about the corrective, and uh, in each of these, there's a confusion. One of you said this as we started talking about the four John texts, is that there's there's a confusion that needs to be clarified. There are these. Um, uh, assumptions that each of these uh, persons that are encountering Jesus or these groups um, are in, that are encountering Jesus are bringing to the, the encounter. You know, so uh, Nicodemus, this teacher who doesn't understand things, and yet he's the teacher of, you know, uh, of things to, to the masses, this woman who understands things from a different uh, tradition, and has her own preconceived ideas. Um, the question about the blind man, when we get to John 9, who sinned, um, and, and then um, um, the expectations uh, of Mary and Martha uh, at, at you know their brother's death and what Jesus could have done to prevent it, or, you know, it, all of these are encounters, it's one thread. All of these are encounters where assumptions about what encountering Jesus would mean for our life. And the conversation is, is much deeper than that. It's more than, to use the language we were talking about uh, last week, it's more than the quick fix. It's, 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 it's an encounter with what God is doing in the world. And that is the glory. When you talked about lifting up, that's what I think about, that, I, that Jesus would be glorified. And that that glory is changing from uh, centering around the crucifixion, which in one way was a means to an end, um, so that Jesus could be returned to heaven, 
the ascension. And that's the place where uh, our uh, advocate, the counselor, uh, is sent. You know, so all of these themes are coming around. And what I want to do in this in this little brief paragraph I'm doing is to stir up confusion to say, oh, my goodness, I, there are so many different ways I can go with this. And that's the point I want to make. Each of the texts, John 4, uh, John 3, John 4, John 9, John 11, are beginning with confusion because we have these familiar assumptions. And Jesus is saying something else. And, and now I'm going to make a lean. Uh, and that something else is, is, is our favorite verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. And uh, Caroline, I think I've mentioned this uh, before, teaching with you and having you open up that, that text uh, for the class meant it was opened up for me in just how to link that text to the Genesis text which is um, the blessing that the descendants of Abraham and Sarah are going to be is not for one people group. It's not for one genetic line, but it is for all the nations that were scattered in Genesis 11. And so this, this one little verse, for God so loved the world in an overarching theme of how do I clear up misconceptions or assumptions about what God is doing in the world could be how you run through Lent with these next four Sundays. And I think going back to, uh, yeah, and and those misunderstandings are uh, typically Johannine, <laughs> but I think they also open up a, an important stance of faith and believing in relationship because in the Gospel of John, believing is always a verb. It's never a noun. And so you're not what the encounter with Jesus is not something that you're supposed to get yeah. or understand. Uh, it is an encounter that invites you into eternal life. And 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 no one should get it right away. I mean, it's just that the word became flesh is not something that that you go, oh, yeah, sure, I get it. <laughs> There's going to be thousands of misunderstandings of how is this even possible. And uh, and so the John 3.16 text, I mean, I, this is where uh, I was talking about, you know, what does life mean? Believes in him that may not perish, but have eternal life. I think you really need then to fast forward to 17.3, yes. where, where, Jesus defines what eternal life is, and eternal life is, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's what life is. And so that, as I was saying earlier, that sort of collapsing of time, I think one of the things that is difficult about the church seasons, but particularly Lent is this sort of, uh, this sort of linearity <laughs> of we, you know, the cross and the resurrection and the ascension when, uh, John doesn't really let us do that. No. I, uh, somehow you have to hold all of them together and what all of them together mean, uh, in this encounter, in each of these encounters. And, uh, and so it, it, it really, uh, it, that uh, that relationship or that in, in integrity or the connections between the entirety of, of the word becoming flesh is sort of the theological challenge then for this for this passage or for John. For John, I really appreciate you bringing in uh, John seventeen three um, because that this idea of what is life uh, eternal. And it's to know God. And wow, what's the hardest thing to know is to know another. And it's hard enough to know myself, mm -hmm. but to know another. And, and so it, it isn't a, uh, a, a momentary shift, but it is an ongoing relationship. Yep. Um, I'm going to be Wesleyan here and say that it is the way of discipleship. Oh wait, did that sound a little Star Warsy? But anyway, uh, uh, it it is this journey together of being held accountable in relationship, 
and and coming into the way of perfection. It's not a destination. It's the it's about the journey. And that makes it so much more exciting because every single day we get to encounter something new and marvelous about the presence of God. And when you tell the story with that way, when you get to these details with where do you glimpse God and what marvelous, outstanding thing is happening? Not just the raising of the dead, not just the healing of the blind, not just having a story that will make you go and tell your whole neighborhood, everything in the past is over. And not just something that will make you say, every single thing I've known and been teaching has been pointing in the wrong direction. And that's that's Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. Everything that he had known and had been teaching had lost sight. And that builds on what we were saying last week as we were looking at Matthew, is uh, is getting this right is not gonna be a momentary instantaneous thing. It's are we willing to be in a community on this journey together? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we know that Nicodemus is that messed up and confused though? Well, I never know Jesus what to make is. of him. Yeah, Jesus says, you know, and, and maybe there's a little tongue in cheek in there. Uh, I like to read it more in that way. Are you a teacher of the law and you don't understand this thing? Where is that? Uh, eight? Yeah, that's in verse 11. 11, yeah. Or um, 10, I'm sorry. Well, it, it, it Nicodemus is a, I mean, that's that takes us in a whole other different direction. It because it Nicodemus that's fine. I just, yeah. No, Nicodemus is a really complicated character uh, and because he shows up again and then this would be another direction that the preacher could take is that he shows up again in chapter seven and then of course at the burial of Jesus. And so the scholarship is pretty, uh, pretty out of tie as to whether or not J uh, Nicodemus ever came around uh, to recognize who Jesus was. But the other kind of contextual thing is the way in which he sets he set beside the Samaritan woman at the well too. So uh, it's not it, is it really is it about whether or not he misunderstands or it doesn't get it? It's more than that. It's more it's more of uh, uh, it it well it's uh, it's what is it's his okay it's his crisis moment. It's yeah. it's his three nineteen moment. And anybody can be there. A disciple can be there. Um, a Nicodemus, somebody in the know can be there. The woman at the well can be there. The blind man can be there. Anybody can be there. And that crisis moment is this for, and this is the judgment or this is the crisis that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light. So, uh, so for each and every one of these characters, it's their moment of decision. It's their moment of discernment. And everybody's on the same plane because God so loved world. the world. Uh, and so it, and so in, in some ways that's part of the, you know, existential moment to use a little bit of Boltman here, but that's the existential moment here of John is it puts everybody in that same place. Mm -hmm. And um, will someone continue in the conversation and grow in their um, in their recognition of who Jesus is, or not? And and so that first encounter with Nicodemus is is you know still up in the air because we don't know. You have to make some decisions as to what happens in seventeen and or sorry yeah, 17. seventeen. Seven, but, yeah, and and. In, in the, the first encounter, not, not the burial one, but when he's with the leaders, whether he's made his, you know, shift or not, he's defending Jesus. You know, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's not, you know, he's not, I'm sure this guy's a problem and I'm going to join you in making sure we get rid of him. He's, he's asking some questions. He's, you know, he's saying, maybe you need to be on this journey of discernment too. Um, and, uh, I, I think that's, that's worth us. It's contrasted with the woman at the well who, well, for one, Jesus tells her straight out, <laughs> I'm the Messiah. Um, but she straight out believes, you know, you, you, just because you've been told point blank doesn't mean you accept it point blank. And so we have one who's 
discerning and questioning and seeking and asking, and we have one who gets it, and there's that whole world in a different way. You know, however it is that we need to go on this journey to knowing God, Jesus is willing to walk with us there, to tabernacle with us there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, we should go on. <laughs> Oh, we probably should. Oh my this God! Do you, have, do you have more in your notes on this, Caroline? Oh, always. But there, you know, this is the problem. Not the problem. This is the joy of John. <laughs> One can just keep on keeping on. But uh, yeah, we should move on. <laughs> and I made the I made the 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 reference for 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 Genesis twelve that I just think is is worth recognizing in this promise. Um, so often as I was introduced to this text, it was about the call and leaving what is familiar. Um, so go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land you don't know, a place you aren't familiar with that God's going to show you. But at this point, I am just captivated by why. And the why is in verse two, so that you will be a blessing, that God is doing this to Abram and Sarai for the sake of all the other families in the earth, for the whole world that God loves. That, that, that's a powerful way to read that text for me now. And I can't, I can't, I, I, I can see the other, but I just think that if you're going to take a look at, at Genesis 12, don't look at that uh, going from and look at the promise uh, of, of this is for the whole world. It's, it, it, Jesus didn't say to, to God, hey, dad, you know, we need to stop looking at the Jews and, and go, go after everybody else. From the very beginning, the whole creation of this non-existent people that we know as ancient Israel was for the sake of all the nations that are scattered in Genesis 11, because God so loved the world. That's, I'm le learning a lot. This is good. I, I appreciate the connection between this and, and God so loved the world. I hadn't honestly thought of that until, <laughs> until we so started psalm, recording. But what's that? The psalm. Oh, I was going to say something about Genesis 12. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Well, I promise I'll be quick. How about that? No. Well, you know, now that we're really in Lent and we're past the, the testing and temptation of last week, there's it's really a, quite a mixture of Old Testament texts. It's mm -hmm. an opportunity where I think a church might do some examination, and this could be a good Wednesday night thing, of its past or of its, of its charter, its reason for mm -hmm. existence. And so here you have a text about being blessed to be a blessing as the purpose of this congregation to exist. Is it to serve its members? Is it to bless the world and to explore that a little bit? Next week, you can talk about complaining uh, and God providing. I think we've got the choosing of David and questions of leadership after that. I think we've got Ezekiel and the dry bones. I mean, when have we been restored? There's a chance to do some kind of flipping back through the, the family album, so to speak, of a congregation and some texts that that are about, if not origin stories, at least kind of stories where a people gets uh, either either originates in a direction or has their direction shifted in some way, shape, or form. So, hmm. free that. advice for Lenten preaching there. Psalm 121, you asked me about. Mm -hmm. It's about being kept, kept, which is not a verb I use often when I think about my relationship with God, mm -hmm. but God is my keeper. Um, could that What's be another right? way? To, well, could that be another way to think of what does that mean to, for God to say uh, that I will bless you? I mean, could to keep you? Yeah. Well, we say that the Lord bless you and keep you, well, but keep you. I mean, well, I think if you're Abram and Sarai, you're you're worshiping God to help you stay alive in, in a in a world of various warlords who are. I mean, it's. It's a dangerous business back then, way more so than my life is today. Mm -hmm. And a God was supposed to be your guardian, among other things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At least a God worth following. Yeah. Um, so blessing is not just about, my point is about wealth or children. It's about also survival, sustenance, right. loyalty to you and to that God. 
Yeah, and I think that's what I was trying to um, that I was thinking about is how do we how do we shift or offer a different perspective on what blessing means is not just and because it it, it can be so misconstrued. Hashtag and, blessed. What's that? Hashtag, Hashtag blessed. blessed. Yeah, and that we really do you know that blessing feels like not just looks like, but blessing feels like being able to lift up your eyes to the hills yes. and knowing that you're kept and knowing that your help comes from the Lord and knowing of that protection and it will who will keep your life. And so that that's what blessing feels like. And uh, and so I think that that's what I meant. Like, could the psalm be a way to uh, to relanguage or unpack that understanding of blessing? Yeah. I, love I like being kept in a world where everything gets traded in or recycled. I'm I'm glad there's somebody willing to keep me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. That's really belonging. Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What's that? That's really belonging. belonging. I, I want I want a God who looks at me and says he's a keeper. So he's anyway. a keeper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not trading him in. I love it. I love it. Sorry, Romans. That was. This is my this is my getting back at you all for the depth of John. I'm just going to give you a bunch of superficial sound bites and all these texts going forward. You dig deep. I'm going to skim the surface. Mm. Romans four. They're really picking the easy Romans passages for us this Lent, aren't they? Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, this is you. You Joy. You mentioned this. I'm sorry, am I talking too much now? Um, no, no. <laughs> Joy, sure. you mentioned that you know the, the gospel doesn't isn't a um, isn't an abandonment of Judaism, of Jesus' Jewish identity, of God's promises to Israel. It's an expansion of them, and and so here you've got, in some ways, in Paul's own vision, going back to Abraham, a, a recognition of of that, and this is the this is the one of the many weird things about the Christian faith is this particularity of Jesus himself as a Jew, as a first century Jew, you know, as a man that creates its own questions and problems about participating in the full human experience, you know, uh, under empire, all these things that mm -hmm. you're like, yeah, but that's so limited, you know, <laughs> of, of, of how God would become in flesh, but it's all then for the sake of mm -hmm. something bigger. So there's a, there's a scandal to particularity that seems not fully full or representative and but this is where i think paul is getting at at least in the second half of this passage or the second set of verses is from that place of particular rootedness and all of the oddness that comes with that come is god's foothold so to speak or god's place from which god will then bless the nations i can't explain that it, but it's this beautiful back and forth that the New Testament is full of between particularity and universality. And what's so key about that, of course, is it's the it's the thing, one of the things that should that should uh, hold us back from supersessionism at all costs. It, not just because it's mean, but also because it's theologically bankrupt and, mm -hmm. and out of step with the way in which Jesus' first followers understood what God was up to and who that God was. So. Mm -hmm. Now I'm done, but if somebody else has something to say about Romans 4, I'm sure. Well, don't just that grin was, and shake your heads. No, that was good stuff. <laughs> well, it matters for the Nicodemus story, too, at some level as well, right? Yeah, this is not right. Jesus, you know, chucking the whole Pharisaic tradition out the door or anything no, like that. No. Yeah. No, no. To use your word before, Jesus is keeping, God is keeping God's promise. Keeper. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>